the safety and resilience of our coastal communi communities is not what it should be. Both Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and Hurricane Sandy in 2012 taught us a number of important lessons. Our coastal protections are inadequate and weak in many places. The natural protection provided by wetlands is disappearing in, in many places as well. I've tried to apply the lessons of earthquake engineering to this problem by developing designs for urban contexts that include offshore attenuation of wave energy, edge protection that includes both ecological and engineering means, and on-land planning and, and regulation. We've also included in our work the work that Michael Oppenheimer mentioned using global circulation models to develop a host of hurricane tracks that we then use to develop probabilistic estimates of the hurricanes, integrating those with the sea level rise estimate that Michael spoke about, and developing a new generation of coastal flood hazard maps for our designs. This work, a number of years ago, led to a number of projects for the New York City area, published in a book that led to an exhibition, Rising Currents, at the Museum of Modern Art, which was very effective at spreading the word and changing many people's minds in the Bloomberg and other administrations around New York, which then came into play after Hurricane Sandy. One of the projects that emerged out of that was a project at Princeton called Structures of Coastal Resilience, which brought in three other universities and the Army Corps of Engineers to develop a series of strategies for four coastal communities along the East Coast. Those strategies were based on this principle of marrying good science, advanced science, with design strategies and using those design strategies to frame the science questions. We looked at one of those communities, for example, in Atlantic City called Chelsea Heights, which is located on an old wetland, in fact, on the back bay. It was badly damaged during Sandy. It's a low-income, vulnerable community that is still suffering from the effects of that hurricane. We developed a series of strategies. My colleague Paul Lewis in the architecture department worked on this, which took the existing conditions, which include a lot of abandoned lots, a lot of abandoned homes, but still enough residents to make a community, and sketched out a series of strategies that led to, we think, ultimate adaptation and resilience of that, of that community. That included raising roads, incorporating utilities in the raised roads, raising houses, developing some of the abandoned lots into wetlands that replaced the wetlands that had been lost when the settlement came here, and including canals as well that would drain the, the community in the event of a flood, but also feed those wetlands, and generally trying to enhance the quality of life and the economic circumstances for that community through this transformation, through adaptation. You see here a number of different scenarios over time that show how the implementation of these strategies, the edge protection, the wetlands, the canals that feed those wetlands and also drain the, the community in the event of a flood, how those evolve over time and how they would then respond to the changes in sea level rise and the consequences relative to the storms. These different scenarios that we develop through both the evolution of the design and the evolution of the context, we can then represent through what we call dynamic performance-based design, which is a matrix where we try to show what happens to both the hazard and the change in time. So here you can look at what might happen to the area around Atlantic City at different frequency levels of flooding. So annual events, events associated with a 100-year return period, and events associated with, with longer return periods that could still possibly happen. You can then look at snapshots of that evolution of both the implementation of the design and the change in the hazard over time and chart the course of your project as it gets implemented along with the changing hazard. That's why we call it dynamic. You can then zoom in to the community, for example, of Chelsea Heights and look at the consequences of these interventions. We think that this creates a framework which is much broader and more useful in understanding how adaptation can, in fact, occur, how you can take into account the amount of time that it will take for it to be implemented, and also the dynamic nature of the hazard. The boxes there that say no data are areas where we still have a lot of work to do to develop the underlying data for these predictions. All of this is meant to establish a framework. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of design work that needs to be done that includes this principle of absorption offshore, protection on the edge, and also planning on land. In some cases, for the possibility that in extreme events, there will be some flooding, but that flooding would be controlled. We hope that in the future, we can develop this strategy in, in more places, both on the science side and on the design side, and use them coupled together to frame the questions that we need to address in both cases. Thank you very much.